happy to see you here today at History in the Kitchen. Today, we are going to be talking about colonial tea. So a little bit about tea culture, a little bit about um, the American Revolution and tea and how tea was politicized. And we are going to make some tea in the colonial style. And I'm also going to be making little cakes from uh, a cookbook from the 1700s. It was called The Art of Cookery. It was by Hannah Glass. And um, it was first published in 1747. And there were several editions after that. There were 40 editions after that. So I'm very excited to be making little tea cakes with you and to be talking with you about colonial tea. Um, so I guess let's get started. First of all, if you would like, please share this video as you're watching so that more people can join me. That would be super. I would love that because I really love teaching. That's why I'm doing this. I don't get paid. I'm not sponsored. I just come on once a week and cook about history because I love history. Um, if you would like to follow me, you can follow me on my page, Teaching History Her Way. That's on Facebook. Uh, I also have a blog where I post the recipe and the lesson from each week. And I also post some teaching tips, some things that I'm doing in my classroom. So if you're a teacher and you'd like to do some of the things that I'm doing, or if you happen to be um, teaching from home, teaching your kids from home this year and you need some ideas for history or social studies stuff, I can help you with that too. And I would love to do that. So my blog is teachinghistoryherway.com. You can also follow me on Instagram. I am actually live on Instagram today too. I'm trying this on two different platforms today. I have two devices going because I haven't figured out how to stream from two to two platforms quite yet. So someday I'll figure that out. Uh, but if you want to follow me on Instagram, I'm also uh, teaching history her way on Instagram and on Twitter. I am just plain old history her way because Twitter didn't give me enough characters to make my full username. So I would love it if you followed me on any of those platforms. I'm constantly posting all of the things that I'm doing. Uh, sometimes they're really great ideas. Sometimes it's just like, hey, this is what's going on in my classroom or here's what I'm thinking. Um, and I'd love for you to interact with me there as well. So let's get started talking a little bit about tea culture. First of all, my sources for today. It's always really important for us to tell what, to say what our sources are. So I'm not just pulling all the information that I'm giving you every week from my brain or making it up. Uh, I used a book called The American Plate by Libby H. O'Connell. You can purchase that on Amazon if you would like to. It's an interesting book. Uh, I also used Colonial Williamsburg's website to get my information and I used the Smithsonian Institution. So lots of really great and wonderful sources for that. All right, so tea was not consumed in the uh, in the American colonies at first. So the American colonies were first settled in 1607 in Jamestown and then uh, the 1620s in, um, in the Boston area in Plymouth. And it wasn't until 1720 that tea culture picked up in the American colonies. And around that time, colonists were drinking between 1.2 and 2 million pounds of tea per year. So that's not per person because that's a lot of tea, but they are drinking that much tea per person per year, or sorry, per year in total. That's a lot of tea. 1.2 million pounds of tea is a lot because if we look at what tea looks like, you can see it here, it weighs practically nothing. So for it to be 1.2 million to 2 million pounds, that's quite a lot of tea that colonists are consuming. British merchant ships brought tea from China and with the tea that they brought from China, they also brought all of the stuff that you needed to have your tea. So tea wasn't just the thing you're drinking. It's also turning into this consumer culture where you have all of the accessories for the tea. And um, the accessories are also mostly going to come from China, particularly the cups, saucers, and teapots because the cups, the saucers, and the teapots are made of porcelain and Europeans hadn't figured out how to make porcelain yet at that point in history. So today we have our teacups. Now interestingly enough about the European tea, or, or about the teacup in the 1700s, they did not have a handle. So when you think of drinking tea and you hold up your pinky finger, that's not happening in the American colonies. They're actually drinking from a tea bowl. It has no handle. And some people are also doing something called saucer slurping, where they're literally taking the saucer and the tea is too hot. So they pour the tea in here, let it cool and then they drink it from the saucer. That is not something that was considered polite to do, but people did it anyway. So this is what a tea bowl looked like. This is a tea bowl. Uh, it looks like a teacup without a handle. And that's what our colonists are drinking out of. 
um, demand for tea and for the serveware was really high. So uh, because the demand was high, tea was rather expensive. So when we are talking about tea in the American colonies, we are talking about a very specific set of people who is drinking that tea. So poor white people are not tea drinkers. And if they are, it's not very often. They're not having morning tea and then afternoon tea. Um, enslaved people are not drinking tea unless they're making their own. Same thing with poor white people. Unless they're making their own out of an American herb, they're not drinking tea from China. So only rich people are drinking tea from China or your upper middle class. They're the only people who can afford the actual drink and who can afford the serveware and also the water, which we'll talk about in a moment because they're a special tea water. So your tea has several accessories. You have your tea cup and saucer. Those are super important because that's the vessel for drinking it. Um, sugar bowls. And I pulled out all the stops for you guys today. I actually took out some of my fine china. So this is my fine china water. Um, sugar bowl. Uh, sugar tongs would also have been used, but I'm not high society tea drinker, so I don't have any sugar tongs for you today. Um, there would also be your teapot. Mine says no stamp act, and we'll talk a little bit about the stamp act in a minute. Uh, teas, tea kettles and tea accessories were used for propaganda and advertising too. There, there was one tea kettle that I saw in Colonial Williamsburg that actually had a love note on it that someone bought to give to their, um, to their significant other. It was really sweet. You would also need a vessel for the cream, and you would need a tea strainer because we're brewing loose leaves. Now I came up with two different answers for how colonists drank their tea. One thing I saw was that they uh, took it off of a tea brick and then they put the, the compressed tea from a tea brick into the teapot. And another that I saw was loose tea. So what do we do when we get conflicting answers in our research? We talk about both because, I, because we're not sure which one is true according to the sources that we use. And then this little guy right here, this is one of, um, this is one of my little favorite things. This is uh, a little slop bowl. This is for the tea, the tea water and the tea leaves that come out. So it's kind of like the garbage bowl that I use. Now, not only do we need the tea to make the tea, but we also need to, um, we also need water. So one of the things that the colonists did when they needed water, and remember, this is just our upper crust colonists. These are our rich white colonists who are either upper middling class or gentry class. Uh, they developed, the colonists developed something called the tea water trade. If you lived in the city, you didn't drink the water. Ew. You have to empty your chamber pot, it goes in the water. You have to empty some garbage, it goes in the water. All the waste went in the water if you lived in the city. So, you didn't drink the water. You actually had to get the water imported from somewhere outside of, outside of your city. So tea men drew water outside of the city and they brought it into the cities. The cost was 45 shillings or approximately $310 a year to bring that water in. That seems kind of steep to us a little bit, but not totally out of reach for many people. But um, it would be like the same thing as having the Nestle or the Poland Spring people coming to bring you water. But the thing about um, salaries back then is that $310 is about what the average tradesman makes in a month. So that's a month's salary for a blacksmith or a silversmith or a tinsmith, and you're not gonna spend a month's worth of your salary on tea water. So this is what we're talking about when we're talking about, um, when we're talking about the wealthy. Um, Rich, I'll show you my teapot, but you can't have it. Maybe we can work on getting you one. All right. So, um, I also have an advertisement. This is from a federal art project that was done in 1936 during the Depression, which we talked about last week. And um, this, was, this is some art that was put in a little history book of the city of New York about getting, um, about getting a water service to the city. So I thought that was pretty cool um, to see. So by the 1750s, about 50% of households in the colonies Owned, uh, owned a tea set. Now let's talk a little bit about manners. Manners were imitated, they were English manners. Anything the British people were doing, American people were doing. And the reason for that is because up until around 1775, if you called a person an American, they wouldn't really know what you were talking about. They identified more as British. So they're gonna use British manners um, 
for tea. They're going to take tea in the morning privately and then again in the afternoon and evening. Afternoon and evening would be your tea party where you have all of the really cool stuff out to show off, um, show off your wealth. They would also have cakes and cold pastries, sweet meats. Sweet meats are not meat, by the way. Sweet meats are pastries. Uh, sugary pastries. They would also have preserved fruits. Sometimes they would have nuts and occasionally they would have wine. So afternoon tea was a really big deal. In addition, they also sold children's tea sets because the big thing was like to pretend you were having a tea party. Um, in fact, there was one little girl, her name was Peggy Livingston. She lived in a super wealthy family and she was allowed to invite over 20 young misses with a card. So she actually sent an invitation to these people, to these children to come over and have a tea party and ball. She was five. All right, um, so the whole family is gonna to come together for tea, and we know that based on some paintings that we've seen. So this is our colonial family. They're gonna come over, come together, and they're gonna to have tea. And the mistress of the house is gonna serve it, or the eldest daughter, or the youngest married woman would serve the tea. Uh, on your tea table, you'd have your teapot, you'd have your slop bowl, you'd have your teaspoons. These are my teaspoons. Their teaspoons would have been quite a bit smaller. Um, your milk or cream container, and um, later on there will be something called a tea urn that's made of metal. All right, I'm gonna go grab my hot water so that I can show you how this is done. The first thing that we're gonna start out with is the tea kettle and the teapot. So my tea kettle is red. I love the, my red tea kettle. And we are going to put the tea in first and we're putting the tea in loose. Now when you make loose tea, you're probably using um, a tea ball and the more you put in, the stronger it's gonna be. So that's one cup, that's two cups. I like it a little stronger, that's three cups, okay? Um, you're probably used to using a tea ball. Uh, they did not. So we're gonna pour that directly on there and put the top on and we're gonna let that steep for about three minutes. I boiled the water prior to you guys coming, so this water is about 190 degrees so that, um, so that it's nice and hot. Okay, so while we wait for that to steep, um, most people are gonna drink from that tea saucer that I showed you. And when I no longer want any tea, there's a way for me to tell my hostess that, I, that I'm done and because it's impolite for me to refuse. So if I walked up to you and I said, would you like another cup of tea and your teacup looked like this, you would say yes, because it would be rude for you to tell me otherwise. Now I wouldn't offer it to you if your teacup was turned upside down and you had the spoon over it. This is how I know at my tea party, you are finished with your tea and I shouldn't offer you any more because it's because even if you don't want it, it's impolite for you to decline. Now, another quick note, I don't know how many of you put lemon or another kind of citrus in your tea. There is no record as far as we know of any colonist using, um, using citrus, using lemon in their tea. Um, it was always milk and sugar. So next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my, my tea saucer, excuse me, and I think we might be a little bit short on the time, but that's okay. I'll pour my tea into my tea saucer. Now the tea saucer is catching all the leaves that are coming out of the pot. So you'll notice, here's, and I'll put it in the slot bowl. We don't put anything on the saucer, because remember, we might actually drink out of that if we're not part of polite society. Next thing I'll do is I'll throw in some cream, just a smidge, and a sugar cube, which is why we have tongs, but I don't have tongs, so we're gonna use my spoon. Depending on how sweet you want it, one or two. Give it a stir. And that sugar should dissolve at the bottom. Okay. And yum. And it's not too strong. There we go. So this is how we would do our tea as a colonist. So I'm gonna move this stuff over so that we can get started cooking. Because remember, we're not only having tea, we are also going to have, I'm gonna actually move this over here because there's some hot liquid in here. 
We're also going to have some sort of, of sweet. So we're not just serving tea. Now in the morning, I might just take my tea by myself, privately with my family, with like nothing. But you don't want to have people over for tea without having food. So we're going to make little cakes. Um, cake is also another word for cookies, so you kind of have to differentiate. Today we're going to make, they're going to look like this when they're done. And they are super, super delicious. I ate them yesterday. Mine have currants in them. I got some dried currants because it's not current season. So I got some dried currants for mine. Basically, they're itty bitty raisins. Um, you can put in some fresh seasonal fruit. So if you chopped up some strawberries, you can make strawberry little cakes or you can um, put in some blueberries because blueberries will shrivel up. Um, I also thought maybe this would be delicious with some chocolate chips. But what, um, but colonists didn't eat chocolate in the way that we eat chocolate today. They drank it, they drank hot chocolate. So I tried to keep as, uh, as true to the recipe as I possibly could, as true to that, 17, uh, to that 1740s recipe as I could. All right, so we'll talk a little bit about British taxation after we get this started. The first thing you're going to wanna do is you're going to wanna preheat your oven to 350 degrees. So if you haven't done that yet, please do that now. These are gonna cook for about 25 minutes. All right, so first things first, you're going to cream two sticks of butter. So grab your butter. Now, I would not be dressed like this if I was doing the cooking, but we also have to keep in mind that if I'm, um, if I'm having a tea party and if I have the kind of wealth that we're talking about to spend $310 a year on clean water, um, I am also uh, not gonna be cooking this stuff myself, okay? There's going to be someone enslaved doing this for me or and or someone who is indentured. So an indentured servant is someone who would have to work for me or my family for a certain number of years according to a contract um, in exchange for my paying for their voyage to come here from Europe. Okay, so I'm using my stand mixer today. Yesterday I did, um, oh yes, Lynn, I'm really nervous about cooking in my beautiful dress, so we're just gonna cross our fingers and hope that this works out. All right, so um, <laughs> I used my hand mixer to do this for Test Kitchen yesterday. A hand mixer will work just fine to cream the butter, and once you're done creaming the butter, and I just, I just use my hands because Hannah Glass's recipe says use your hands, so I did. Um, so you're in good shape even if you don't have a stand mixer. My, uh, my butter is room temperature. Yesterday I did it when it was out of the refrigerator for about 10 minutes, so it wasn't room temperature yet and it still worked out okay. All right, so let's cream this butter. Shouldn't take too long to do this. Now, the reason I spoke to you about tea culture before I got into the politics of tea is we really need to understand why tea was such a, such a sticking point for people during the, um, during the American Revolution or just before the American Revolution. And um, that's one thing that history classes don't usually cover. So we talk about how there was a tax on tea and everybody was mad, but it's just like, why was anybody really mad about tea? What's the point? Who cares? People cared. People cared a lot, especially if they're consuming that amount of tea. Now, we also have to remember that during the American Revolution or in the lead up to the American Revolution, the people who were making the policies, the people who were making the laws, who were doing the boycotts, who were the most upset about British law are the ones that are in the upper crust of society who are drinking tea. So when we think about the American Revolution, we have to remember it was about a third of people um, who cared and wanted to break away from England, a third of people were loyalists and wanted nothing to do with, um, with breaking away or independence, and then there was a whole third of people who were like, what's going on? Who cares? Let me just make sure I survive until tomorrow. So when we're talking about people getting upset about tea, we're talking about this upper crust of society, the people who are in charge. Um, the people who aren't in charge aren't worried about their tea, I promise, because they're worried about making, making do from day to day. All right, so butter is creamed, looks really good, super yummy. Don't lick the butter, that's kind of gross. Okay, um, the next thing that you're gonna wanna do is we're going to have to uh, beat our eggs in uh, beforehand. Now, you need three eggs, I'll grab another bowl. You need three eggs, but you only need two whole eggs, and then the other, you just need the yolk. Um, so I'll show you how, to, how I do that. Um, you might mess up and that's okay. And remember, I always have my garbage bowl over here so that I don't have to worry about, um, about getting rid of the garbage in the garbage can or putting it somewhere on the table. Um, I just put it right in the garbage bowl and then I toss the whole garbage, the whole contents of the garbage bowl later. All right, so this is gonna be my egg yolk egg. 
And I'm gonna do this super, super carefully. Make sure I hold it up like this so that, oops. There we go. So that just my egg white comes out. So if you can see how I'm doing this. Now, I also want to be really careful not to crack the yolk because I don't want to lose any of it. This is also the part where I need to be super careful of my sleeves that are covering my elbows because after all, I need to be a, um, a decent woman and keep my, my elbows covered at all times. So if I notice that there's still some white in there, I'm just going to kind of pass it back and forth and force that egg white away from the yolk. So there it is. All right, I think I've got it. I'm gonna put that yolk in there. And I've got more garbage for my garbage bowl. I'm also gonna give my hands a quick little wash because I don't really want to get the egg yolk all over the place. All right, so the next thing that we're gonna to have to do is we're gonna to have to beat this egg. So, or um, you can just throw it in there. Either one of those is fine. Um, yesterday, I didn't, uh, I didn't beat the eggs in advance and it worked out. So I'm going to add my eggs to my butter mixture. First, I'm gonna stir. Okay. In go the two whole eggs and one white. Next thing that's gonna go in is my sugar. Just a little bit at a time. We don't wanna overwhelm it. In 1767, the British passed a law called the Townsend Act. And the Townsend Act put a tax on different everyday items like lead, glass, paper, paint, and tea. Um, merchants wanted to boycott because of, uh, boycott British goods because of the Townsend Act. And a lot of people decided that they were gonna boycott tea and they were gonna make American substitutes but many people just drank tea anyway because what was happening is 90% of the tea coming in after the Townsend Acts were passed was coming in from the Dutch, um, the Dutch India Company. So because it was Dutch tea, people didn't feel so badly about it and they drank it anyway. Um, they also decided that they were gonna drink some tea substitutes. Raspberry leaves were often used as a tea substitute um, in the colonies during any kind of, um, during any kind of boycott. Now, the Townsend Acts were important, and all of these taxes are important, including the Stamp Act that my teapot um, is protesting, because most of these laws that British, the British were passing prior to the American Revolution between 1763 and 1773 were tax laws. And the reason the British people were passing these tax laws was because they thought that the colonies needed to help pay for the French and Indian War, which was fought on American, on, uh, on colonial soil. The colonists benefited from it. The colonists also fought in it. They were soldiers in uh, the French and Indian War. They were the primary, uh, primary soldiers in this. George Washington fought in the French and Indian War. In fact, he pretty much started it. And um, the Stamp Act actually put a tax on paper. This was later repealed because there was a petition to the king and the king happened to listen. Um, the king and parliament actually they um, repealed the Townsend Acts too. They were partially repealed in 1773. That's great, except the tax on tea was not repealed. That tax stayed on. All right, we're gonna start putting our flour in while we're talking about taxes. This is another thing that's gonna be gradual. This will thicken your dough. And the last thing you're gonna put in is your fruit. I'm actually going to grab this attachment to help me get the flour in so that I don't spill it everywhere. Um, my KitchenAid mixer, I think, is my favorite kitchen tool ever. All right, and as that flour mixes in, we're gonna throw in the currants or the fruit or whatever, um, whatever it is that you are using. I'll show you these. They smell like raisins, they look like raisins. It's just they're not giant like raisins. They're very petite, I like them a lot. Take a look, these are my dried currants. Okay, so um, 
The reason why the colonists were so upset about taxation wasn't because they didn't want to pay their fair share to be a part of the British Empire. They understood that, they wanted to be a part of the British Empire, they wanted so badly to be whole members of the British Empire that they wanted um, representation in Parliament. They did not elect a representative to go to Parliament. And the King and Parliament didn't let them, even after they've asked. So the taxes, they didn't think the tax was necessarily unfair. The tax was fairly low considering what the rest of the British Empire was paying. So colonists paid about what, about a quarter of what um, people who lived in Britain were paying for taxes. Their sticking point was the representation. They didn't authorize the tax. So they had no problem paying the taxes that their local governments passed. It was the it was the imperial government's taxes that they had a huge problem with, because um, because they weren't represented, because there was no representation. So um, there was more enforcement um, under after the Townsend Acts were repealed because the the British passed something called the um, the Tea Act which wasn't a tax on tea. So don't let anybody tell you the Tea Act is a tax on tea. There was already a tax on tea before the Tea Act. What the Tea Act did was it gave a monopoly to the British East India Tea Company. So they were the only ones who could sell tea in the colonies, which was nothing new. But they also put colonial merchants out of business because the British no longer allowed merchants to sell tea to the colonists. So let's just pretend that I am a colonial tea merchant. My livelihood is buying that tea and then distributing it to stores. By cutting me out, I am, uh, I am losing money. Now, you would think that as a colonial tea merchant, I'm the only one who would care, but the other colonists cared too. Because basically what they said is Britain isn't letting us run our economy the way we want to run our economy. So this is just another way of Britain controlling us that we don't like. So um, they wanted to be able to do business on their own terms, and they didn't. And this is, um, this is when things got really hairy. Um, ports were turning away ships that were carrying tea. Um, they were successful in Philadelphia and New York. They told the ships to turn around and go back to where they came from, and those ships did, but not in Boston. The royal governor of Boston said, no, you have to let those ships take their cargo off. And the people said, no, we don't. We're not going to let them. And there was a standoff. So on December 16th, 1773, there was the famous Boston Tea Party where the uh, colonists, a group of colonists who actually planted in a coffee house, just saying, bit of trivia, a group of colonists went onto a ship in Boston and um, threw several um, crates of tea, the crates were about this big, um, into Boston Harbor, which was over a million dollars in today's dollars worth of, uh, worth, da worth of damage. Now, Boston wasn't the only place that had a tea party. Tea parties were also happening in, um, in other places after the one in Boston. So there was one in Philadelphia, there was one in Charleston, there was one in a city in Maine, um, there was one in Annapolis. And in Annapolis, what they did was they set the ship on fire and they made sure that the ship captain's pregnant wife could see the ship on fire from her window while she was giving labor. So this was no joke. They would pour boiling tea down the throats of tax collectors. Um, things got really violent in the colonies. Things got riotous. So people rejected tea after these tea parties for patriotic reasons. Um, people made up stories and published them about how you were going to get sick from drinking British tea. That looks lovely. In, um, from drinking British tea, so they made up these illnesses. Um, and there's also a, a, a lovely poem that was published in the 1770s. Farewell the tea board with your gaudy attire, ye cups and ye saucers that I did admire. To my cream pot and tongs I now bid adieu, that pleasures all fled that I once found in you. It's like a love poem breaking up with your tea. It's pretty awesome. Um, and the end, uh, at the end of the poem says, Liberty is the goddess that I do adore, and I'll maintain her right until my last hour. Before she shall part, I will die in the cause, for I'll never be governed by tyranny's laws. So, pretty strong poem, written by a woman, by the way. Ladies were the key to all of these boycotts, because ladies were the ones who were spending the money and buying the household inventory. All right, so once you are finished mixing, you should have a nice batter. And um, once again, I will be using Pam. Pam is not part of the recipe. Pam is not part of any colonial recipe. However, we are really lucky to live in this century where we have these things that are gonna help us keep 
our food from sticking to the pan. So I'm using a muffin tin. And I'm just gonna do a couple for you. Now you can use the batter. Uh, yeah, we'll do six for now. Um, I like to spread it around. I use my finger to make sure that I get absolutely every spot in the pan. All right. And you can do this in a couple of ways. This is where I'm gonna pull up. I'm gonna show you my elbow now. Sorry, everybody, if I offend. Okay, so you're gonna take this and you're either going to roll it into a ball, okay, and plop it in there, or you can take it and you can press it into the bottom of the pan. They do not grow. These do not grow. There's no, um, there's no baking soda or baking powder in here to make them, um, to make them fluffy. They are not fluffy. They are very dense. So, um, so however big you make them is however big they're going to be. I don't recommend putting them just on a baking sheet because they can get like blobby. This helps them, this helps them keep their, um, keep their shape. So you're going to put them in the oven at 350 and you're going to bake them for 25 minutes. But lucky you, I have like a magical time machine. I cook on, I cook the day before also. And I have them right now. So here we have our little colonial tea party, our cup and saucer, and our tea cakes. Um, now you might be wondering why we drink coffee today. That's something that I wanted to very quickly address because we no longer have this British tea culture that we had for so long. Um, in 1783, we actually went back, or the Americans actually went back to drinking tea after the American Revolution. So tea was really just on principle; they stopped drinking it. It was a sticking point to the to the British um, to the British Crown um, and to the British East India Tea Company for taking advantage. Um, but they're going to go back to drinking tea in 1783. We are going, Americans are going to become coffee drinkers during the Civil War when the Union Army gave coffee as part of the rations. And then the coffee, um, the, the soldiers kind of liked the taste, so they brought that coffee drinking habit home with them after the war was over. So it was the Civil, it was the Civil War in the 1860s when Americans became coffee drinkers. All right, well, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope that you learned about colonial tea culture. I hope you learned about why it was so important and how it was a cause of the American Revolution. Um, after the Boston Tea Party, Britain really came down hard and punished the colonists for doing what they were doing. They tried to make an example out of Boston, and that's when the Americans had had enough. So, um, if you liked this video, please share it for me. Let, uh, please let me be able to inform others about American history, about our history as a country. Remember, history is made by every shade. Everyone is a part of this. I hope you enjoy your little cakes and your tea. Cheers. And if you'd like to follow my blog or get the recipe later, my blog is www.teachinghistoryherway.com. You can also follow me here on Facebook or on Instagram at Teaching History Her Way or even on Twitter at History Her Way. And I will see you next week on Saturday when we will be talking about the Supreme Court, the origins of the Supreme Court, and about the uh, three female justices who held, um, who held the bench or currently hold the bench with, in the case of Sonia Sotomayor and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. But we're also going to throw Sandra Day O'Connor in there because she is also super awesome. I will see you next week. Have a great weekend.